There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. I would like to welcome back for her second appearance on Bite Size Book Chats, my friend Erica from Baton Rouge. Erica, mm-hmm. hello again. Hello, hello. How lovely to have you back. Thank you so much. And uh, I believe you've got a, a beverage in honor of this suspicious. Yeah, story. so it's my Suntory Japanese whiskey, which I get every year as a Christmas gift from oh. my adorable. Um, he says this is my walking around whiskey because it's, um, you know, I can drink this every day instead of my super expensive scotch that I kind of save for special. So my and, walk uh, I think it cut out just when you said your adorable what? Your adorable. My husband. Your adorable husband. All right. And it's, uh, can you, sh- do you mind showing the bottle? Oh yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Here we go. It's Suntory my... Toki. Yes. Well, oh, I'm good. sure you can get really expensive Suntory uh, scotch. It's, it's scotch, right? Uh, well, I, I whiskey. suppose it's whiskey. It's whiskey. Um, it's whiskey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're big whiskey drinkers in Japan. I, uh, I That's don't... cool. I haven't tried the expensive stuff because I can't afford it, but the cheap stuff mm-hmm. gives me a hangover. One, one, one glass and I have a oh. headache, so <laughs> I stick to my girly white wine. That's fine. So, so does my husband. He always gets the Pinot Grigio and I usually get like a Macallan or something. So all good. Very good. Well, uh, let's speaking of girly books that you've read a girly book from the, uh, 18th century, and I, I should strike the word girly from the record here because this she's an Anglo Irish <laughs> novelist, Frances Sheridan. Yes, so that's the cover. Um, oh, you have a paper copy. Oh, great. Yeah. Yes, I bought this on a whim. So, uh, Memoirs of Miss Sydney B- Bidolf, 1761. Yeah, and you read volume one of a three volume Correct. novel. Yeah. She's yeah. most known for this novel. She happens to be the mother of, of the famous playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And I think I studied one of his plays in university. She's mm-hmm. not nearly as famous as she should be, but you and I are going to, the School for Scandal, I think is his most famous one. Um, and you and I are going to change that. We're going to make her famous through this bite-sized book chat. So tell us about her and or the book. And- um so you know i read a little bit of her biography um she died fairly young i think she was 42 she was married to an actor and they traveled around england and ireland it seems like a lot it seems like they were always kind of down on their luck i think one of their theaters burned down they never really recovered from that um her son that is the famous playwright i think actually borrowed some material from her well i yes i read that's true. um but it sounds like they you know her family life was fairly intellectual and and she hung out with a lot of contemporary writers and i'm just imagining her you know jotting down notes in between having these actors over being all you know raucous in her house you know so i think it's 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 interesting to have a publication from a woman from that that era definitely and mm-hmm. one of her uh, contemporaries that she knew personally and he let me look this up so I get it right. She was influenced by him to start writing is Samuel Richardson. Yeah. And in particular, his novel, Pamela. I am in the middle of reading his more, even more famous novel. Oh, Pamela was earlier. Pamela was published in 1740. So that novel yeah. had quite an influence on her writing of this one, apparently. Clarissa, which I'm in the middle of, it's taking me forever, uh, was 1748. What's the premise of the of the novel? Um, you know, it's 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 very readable. It's um, not difficult to follow. It's full of melodrama. You know, if you like Julian Fellowes miniseries, or you like uh, even Jane Austen, it's it's kind of got that feel. It's definitely upper crust society trying to find the perfect marriages for their daughters and that kind of thing. However. There are some kind of different kinds of perspectives in this one in that it's not this headstrong, you know, strong heroine. It's this woman struggling with a sense of familial duty and duty to her husband and trying to, um, I guess, tap down her own self-worth and just do what she's always been told. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that changes in volumes two and three, because I can't imagine Francis Sheridan would have gone into that. 
Um, but it's been very interesting to read it from the point of view of somebody writing during that time. Sure. Are there lots of characters? It's a pretty big book. Or you've read the first yeah. of three volumes. Are there quite a few characters? Yeah, quite a few. But it's, it's not hard to keep everybody straight. And, you know, women are either virtuous or they're complete sluts. And the men are pretty much all terrible. Hmm. Uh, she got half of the human nature right. She got the men right. <laughs> the men are all awful. And then uh, a, a girl's utmost desire is to please her mother. To please um, her mother. Please her mother. And so oh, she just okay. wants... So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of talk of finances and money and uh, inheritances. And then there are people getting, you know, I don't want to give you any spoilers, but people doing things outside of wedlock that they shouldn't be doing and uh, getting screwed over and betrayed. And so that's kind of fun, <laughs> kind of fun to read about. So not particularly a feminist story, but are you finding feminist kind of moments in it? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. And, and some of the women are kind of terrible, too. A lot of them are connected. Cannot- so, you know, it makes for a good story. I thought it was going to be kind of dry, and it's really not. Oh, if they very go interesting. The series, like on the BBC or something, it'd be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> very interesting. Now, the family has continued to be literary. A couple of her daughters wrote plays. and her, I think her granddaughter wrote about her. Granddaughter hers. wrote something. Yeah. So, very interesting family. That's and cool. I should say that my great-great-grandmother's family name is Sheridan. Alice oh. Sheridan. Yep. She died what? in Saskatchewan. She and her husband, my great, great grandfather, Henry Mooney, uh, uh-huh. moved from Ontario to uh, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan didn't exist quite yet, but, oh. Oh. Um, and homesteaded. And she died there in about 1906. And my great uncle was named Sheridan, Sheridan Mooney. So Sheridan is a, is a family name for me. But- so maybe <laughs> I'm related to her. That you should trace that back. That'd be yeah, cool. Yeah, melodrama. I think it kind of runs in the family. The flair. <laughs> so you are you're definitely planning to continue reading the, yes. the other couple yeah. of volumes. Yes, I'm intrigued now. I'm invested. So Erica, thank you so much. Thank you too. I appreciate look, it. Look forward to having you back. This is an extraordinary pleasure for me to welcome a South African novelist to my channel and to Bite Size Book Chats. He's going to tell us a bit about his own work, and he's going to come back for some long-form chats about his own two published novels. He's here to tell us about another uh, uh, novel from South Africa. Please welcome Mpatumi Mtabane. From uh, born in the Eastern Cape and lives in Cape Town and uh, his friends and maybe other people. I'm going to try to see if I can get away with calling him by his short name, his nickname, Mpush. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love most, most people know me as Mpush anyway. So you are in, you are in a good company because we're becoming friends now. Well, wonderful to hear. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sean. I'm very, very, very happy to be here. I am an avid reader and watcher of your show. So this is quite a, an honor for me to be here. This, the, which shocks the hell out of me. So thank you. You have given me some very <laughs> kind words as we've been uh, setting up this interview. And I hope that you will become a regular guest on my channel from here on in. I look forward to on that. And then we can talk about some African literature. There is a lot that is, that is going on, on, on on this side, on the continent, actually. But especially in the southern part of it, it's uh, we have a, a, a kind of a new revival of an African literature, I feel. I think what helps us, sorry, what helps us uh, in this particular time in African literature is trying to wrestle with the ghost of our history. Almost every African book I see now, that, that is what is happening, uh, including the one that has just won the Men Booker Prize, Damon Galvert. Yes, and you were a fan of that book, which uh, I was delighted by because I was a big fan of it as well, but I was a little bit, uh, had a problem with the fact that two white South African novelists were nominated for the Booker and no black South African novelists. Well, I think the, the fault of that comes not from that we lack any quality black writing in, in, in South Africa in particular. It's just that most of uh, uh, black writing in South Africa that doesn't get exposed in, in the UK and the US. So Damon is an old, I mean, is a, is, a, is a writer that is known most in the West than inside, if I may say so. 
I don't know for for whatever reason, uh, black writers in, in Africa generally, but in South Africa in particular, don't get much exposure being uh, by being published in the UK or the US. I think the fault lies there. Well, I hereby make it uh, one of the missions of my channel to address that. So fabulous. <laughs> so uh, tell us about your. This will be a short, short uh, elevator pitch for your two novels. And uh, like I say, you're, you're going to come back in the new year, and we're going to have a lo- lengthy, luxuriant chat about them. But tell us about your novels. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Yeah, when you invited me, we we, we came for Footy's book. So I'm just going to be very brief about my own stuff. I first published my debut novel in 2017, and it was published by the Black Bag Books. It's the only publisher here in South Africa that is owned by a Black woman. And she's doing a fantastic job. She's doing a fantastic job, and she's telling stories that were not told, that were perhaps traditionally rejected on a more established white publishing houses. So she's getting a, a, a footing into the publishing world, of course. You know how difficult it is to get into that published world. In South Africa, it's quite monopolized between the few big uh, publishers. But yeah, we, we support her a lot. So and then we, 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 we love her and we think she's doing a, a, a great job. My book is a historical novel, actually, the first one that she, she published, which is called The Broken River Tent. And uh, it, it's about the Tosa chief who led four out of uh, nine frontier wars against the British in the, in the 19th century. And I felt that his story of heroism and all that stuff was never told. So I, I, I decided to, to tell that. I, I, I love history. I spend a lot of time on the historical archives. So I, I wanted to tell that story now in a more of an entertainment mode, So that, which is why I, I decided to use the historical uh, fiction mode. I was lucky that it, it won one of our prestigious prize, which is called the University of Johannesburg uh, debut novel. Mm-hmm. So I was lucky uh, about that. And then and it kind of um, put me into a, a prominence, if, if you know what I mean. And then people started noticing my book. So by the time I, I was publishing The Wanderers, which was published in, in July this year, I had quite an, an, a, a following of readers. And then my publisher just told me last week that it's doing very well. The Wanderers is kind of a different book because it, it interrogates a closer history, which is the a history of a ANC MK soldier exile in uh, Tanzania, USSR, and uh, all over the world. And then he had decided he decided not to come back. And then in a way, I, I decided to interrogate why why would he decide not to come back in, after ninety four when the political parties in 92 were unbanned. And then I used his daughter he never met to look for his life. And then the book is about that, basically. It was published in in July. They both sound absolutely fascinating. So you were on a podcast episode to do with the uh, South African Literary Festival. And it's a fantastic conversation between you and uh, Damon Galbit and the author of the book that we're going to now turn our attention to, Huti Njengila. I put a link in the show notes because that is a fabulous uh, discussion about some of the commonalities, and you're going to be talking about some of them as we talk about uh, Huti's book. But uh, Huti Njengila and and her novel with a really uh, tantalizing title, They Got to You Too. Tell us about this novel. Yeah, let me let me start about the, the title. Is, I, I, don't, I don't think it will be revealing too much if I explain to you where the title comes from, because myself, when I started reading that novel, the title just baffled me. I just I was thinking about where, what does that mean they got to you too? So this is a book about a dying old uh, man. He is an Afrikaner. He, he was in the army uh, during the apartheid regime. And then he was in the, in the police uh, during the, the time when we, uh, of Mandela. And then he was one of the leading generals. And then he, he was basically one of the people involved with, with the transition of the, the army and the police into the new dispensation. And uh, yeah, he's a very irritating old man and very opportunistic, <laughs> as, you, as you can imagine, because now he's trying to traverse his world between the old masters and the new masters. The, the part that makes it irritating to me about him is that he hasn't actually changed his mind more than he is just uh, taking the opportunities that are there for himself uh, now. He's being cared for uh, on, on this hospice kind of uh, hospital 
by this woman, a young woman who herself has got an association with a father who went to exile and all those things. And then they start sharing information and uh, they both read each other's journals. And then she is wrecked. She, she is forced to come up into the ghost of his own personal life and his own history. And then he starts his, his history from the, the time his family of the Boer War, which is when the Afrikaners were fighting with the English. And then basically the trust of the story starts there. And then in the end, he is forced to face up about the things that he, he, he did also. But he, the, 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 the interesting part, which I, I don't know, uh, I, don't, I can't get into Futi's mind. Uh, she decided that, but she's not going to make it easy for, for us as readers to be saying, but he's repentant and all those things, you understand? It's just that he is somebody who is there, who's taking advantage of the loopholes in the system and is getting through. Perhaps uh, one of the things I, I did not particularly like on, on, on the book are the coincidences. There seem to be two unreal coincidences between their lives. That's the only, that's the only like a kind of a serious thing I did not like about the book. So that's a pet peeve for, for many a reader, but not all. So that's interesting. This podcast episode, which I keep referring to, so people really should go listen to it because we don't have, we're here on limited time and the extended conversation is just fantastic. But, but lots of parallels, you you say, with um, your writing and Damon Galvet. So what were some of those uh, comparisons? Oh, or... yeah. And then, like, like for instance, what, what Damon and, uh, and Footy do, and they do it wonderfully in, in their books, is that they, their books is almost a summary of a South African history in the past 50 years or so. Do you understand? And so they are commenting on that history. And then they have these characters that are, that are alive and talking because Damon's book uh, is, is this family. And then he uses uh, four funerals and each time uh, somebody dies and then he talks about, about the history of how, how they, they, they lived. So as I said, both of them, uh, Futi herself does that. It, 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 it's a story of a, a summer of a South African history starting with the a, with a Boer War. And then it, what is magnificent about Futi is her sense of empathy and how she's able to get into the mind of this white Afrikaner without judging him. And he, he just, she just lets it be as himself. And then you can, you can see him, and then you can, you as a reader, make up your own mind. She does not put any judgment on him. He, he just puts him as, as raw as he is. And then, I mean, yeah, it's, it's very difficult when you, you, you read it. And, and then I applaud her for that. She, she, she did a magnificent job. On that, so both of them are basically a, a, a highly uh, comment on history. Mine is a little bit different in a sense that it's more pan-Africanist, as much as it looks into the South African history on how we grew up in the 80s, but it also looks uh, on the lives of those uh, who left the country and went to into exile, what they uh, they encountered there in Zambia, in Tanzania, in USSR, where they were being trained. Yeah. And then I complicated my life in a sense that uh, as much as my protagonist uh, decided to eventually uh, stay in Tanzania and, and, and he died there, Tanzania has shared the borders with Rwanda. And because in 1994, when in South Africa, we were having our first uh, democratic elections, we were so excited, we missed what was going on in Rwanda and the genocide. So I wanted to study that. So I, I made him marry a Rwandan, a Rwandan woman who had fled from the Rwandan genocide because I wanted to introduce that topic to the South African readership. What can you tell me about Futi? She, I believe, lives in Pretoria. Uh, yes, she, she, she lives in, in Pretoria now, but she grew up in, in Deben, which is the, the, the province now called the KwaZulu-Natal. And then she, she's almost my age. Damon and, uh, and uh, Foot and myself, that's another thing. We grew up in the 80s. We have that in common between us. And Footy, this is her third novel, actually. This is, yeah. uh, so she's, she's quite a, an experienced writer. She writes wonderfully well. It's a, it's a marvelous book to read. You are doing a very good job of selling it to me. You said you'd like <laughs> to read an excerpt. There is a... A passage, and I think it occurs in page 150 on, on Futi's book, when this, this old man, uh, by the way, he, the old man is called Madala, and Madala in uh, Kosa and, uh, and uh, Zulu is an old man. So that's what mo mostly people will say. And then it talks about uh, how when the transition was, was happening, 
I couldn't say for sure that Mandela taking over was altogether a good thing, but I wouldn't dare admit that because then I would be one of them, which is the oppressors. It felt like we woke up one morning and no one was a racist. Everyone whispered the word kefa, and all of a sudden everyone had a black friend. That's a perfect thesis of that book. <laughs> like, if you know what I mean, that's <laughs> like from the point of view of that man, of Madala, that is his attitude. That is he, he, how he, he lives by. But I, I, I haven't really changed my mind, but I have to get on with the new dispensation yeah, now and, be, and appear as somebody who is not racist and blah, 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 blah. blah. Well, Bush, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. I honestly enjoyed being here. And then, yeah. But as you, as you yourself have seen from, 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 Damon, from Damon's book, there is something wonderful that is happening in African literature at this moment. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. What a delight to welcome Ron Restrepo back for another bite-sized book chat. Ron is from Houston, Texas. Welcome back, Ron. It's a delight to be back, Sean. I so enjoyed the first talk, and so I'm uh, amazed you brought me back. And appreciate yeah, well, you have you shouldn't be amazed at that, but I'm yeah. amazed at all the wonderful new books that you have brought into my life on Twitter, and now uh, and now I brought you on to talk about another one because I had never heard of this book from the island nation of Mauritius. Very newly translated, Kaya Days by Carl de Souza, translated from the French by Jeffrey Zuckerman. And yep. there you've got it. And uh, just do. came out the publication, the translation just came out, goodness, two weeks ago, maybe from Two Lines Press, the original French novella. I believe it's a novella published in 2000. So tell us about this. I'd never heard of this guy or this book. I came across it in the, you know, it's the, the wonderful world of Twitter because I had gotten one of my favorite uh, publishers, independent publishers in the United States is Two Lines Press. So when I saw it, so I immediately picked it up and it's a, a fascinating book. My first uh, Mauritian novelist, uh, the title person, Kaya, is the uh, Mauritian equivalent of Bob Marley, uh, was, was a local, he combined reggae with local music and to their own unique music for Mauritia. And, and I he, believe that unique music was called Sege. That's it. Yeah. So Kaya was performing, and I guess as many performers do, he was smoking weed on the stage, was arrested and died in jail, with the obvious implication being that he was killed by the police and is that a historical event? Is that true? Yes. Okay. That is an historical event that occurred in 1999. Okay. Um, and so this book is wonderful. If folks read it, I would suggest doing it in a single setting because it is a short one, uh, about 120 pages. And I liked it enough and to be ready for today, I read it again today. Uh, uh -huh. So it, it takes a couple hours and it's one of those books that's very propulsive. So once you get into it, it really draws you through it. And so the story is about 10, no, she's about 15 or 16, a young woman by the name of Santi. And as a result of the death of Kaya while incarcerated, there was just, um, uh, it was like many of the things we've seen in the United States recently. I mean, there was just riots in the streets that just moved from, you know, neighborhood to neighborhood. And so all the schools were closing down. And so her mother, the, the narrator's mother, couldn't get in to get her son, her prize offspring from school. So we, he, she said the daughter, Santi. So Santi's about uh, 15, 16 years old. She went to get him at school. So the whole book then is about her process of going to get him at school. He wasn't there. And then her looking throughout the city, uh, Port Lucia, the capital, to find her brother. Sort of a dual story. One of it is back in college long ago, one of the things I studied in political science was the whole was the mass action concept that, you know, that the, the population can be stable and everybody's happy. And then there's a triggering event that causes uh, mass chaos or riots. And this is what happened here. 
So the one story you get is the city as it experiences these mass riots throughout the city and her trying to navigate mm -hmm. the riots to find her brother. And the other piece is she has never been out on her own in the city. So as she's navigating, she meets three characters who are in the city. You're always wondering, you know, what's going to happen when she gets involved with these people. And so that's part of the tension that drives it. And you sort of get those two parallel stories. Wow. Talk about a brutal coming of age. It is. Do you know anything more about the author? I've seen him interviewed. Uh huh? Uh, he's a professor there, and it, it, this is his first publication, but he's written other things. And the story first, that he tells- First publication was, in English, translated. In English, correct. That's right. He's got other books in French, um, and he was trying to get a longer one translated. And when he sent it to the editor, they said, well, this is nice. Do you have anything shorter? And he sent, at the time, was a 30-page rough draft to the beginning of this story. And the editor said, that's the one I want. <laughs> so, okay. And it was translated uh, by Jeffrey Zuckerman. And we had talked about that he's translated several authors from, from this country. From this has, I read his um, translation of Ananda Devi's, um, what was the name of it? Yeah, Eve Out of Her Ruins. Eve Out of Her Ruins a few years ago. Yep. So and he seems to be yeah. specializing in Mauritian writers. I think we've sold everybody on it already. So that is great, Ron. Thank you so much. And your Twitter is a constant source of amazement for me. I hear about books on your Twitter feed, which will be in the show notes uh, that nobody else is talking about. So that's a very valuable service. Keep it up. I intend to, Sean, and I very much appreciate it. Well, this is exciting for me because this is my very first guest from Bangladesh, Uzrat from Taka, Bangladesh, welcome. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. What a delight to meet you. And we, uh, you guys weren't here, but we were talking before the interview started. And uh, I think she's my new best friend. She's wonderful. So. <laughs> oh, that's really sweet of you. Yeah. We are getting oh, along really well. We are. I found Uzrat on um, Instagram and we have been uh, talking on uh, DMing on Instagram for a few weeks to get the interview set up. And it finally came together today. So you do read a lot of interesting stuff and you have a Substack feed that's kind of like an email book blog. Yeah. And your Instagram is really interesting. So all of those links will be in the show notes. And you have recently read, I guess we would say it's a Chinese novel. It's set in China by a Malaysian yeah. Chinese writer, uh, yeah. Five Star Billionaire by Tash Awe, published in yeah. 2013. And you quite liked it. Yeah. Tell us about it. I saw the book in this, one of my favorite books and I wasn't quite sure because I had, hadn't heard about the writer before, but I got to know that this writer was a really underrated writer whose prose is very interesting. So I picked up the book and I read the synopsis and I thought the synopsis was quite interesting. It, it, it describes the story of five people living in Shanghai coming from different backgrounds of life. And I thought it had a very I don't know if you have seen the movie or not, but there's a movie called Crazy Rich Asians. I love the trilogy book. I haven't I read or seen the movie, but... You should, you should. The book is amazing, but that book takes a more light note. It's more humorous, but this one, I felt like this had the same topic, but this is like the dark side of Crazy Rich Asians. Okay. Because it talks about old money and the conflict of old money and new money in Shanghai and China and how interconnected money and li the lives of people are in Shanghai. So I thought that was very interesting. So I picked it up and I read it and I think the writer has a really good writing style. So yeah, I loved it. That is fantastic. Tash Aw has been on my radar for several years, um, but I haven't read any of his stuff. He was born in Taiwan to Malaysian parents. And this is his novel about set, set in China. I think his most well-known novel that I've ever heard of is The Harmony Silk Factory. Yeah. That was 2005. Have you read it or have you read anything else by Tasha? No, I haven't read anything else by Tasha, but I do plan on picking up, picking up this memoir, uh, which was written in 2019. I think it's called Strangers on a Pyre or something. I don't remember. But yeah, 
Yes, 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 yes. Uh, that was an essay about uh, yes, several oh writers from around the world wrote kind of a short essay, book length essay about their face. The series is called oh. The Face. Yeah, that I've had that one bookmarked too to read someday. Yeah. Yeah, so he's done some interesting stuff. So uh, there are a lot of characters in this novel, Five yeah. Star Billionaire. Tell us about one or two of your favorite characters without giving us any spoilers. The thing is, the characters really stay with you, like characters from different backgrounds. And you don't expect the story to stick or go well, but in the end, it sort of comes together. There are five characters. So it's it's really hard job for the writer to go into depth about every character's life. Since it's a small book and you have to go into details, there is the plot as well. But you sort of can connect with each and every character. Like I don't have any favorite because I love each characters okay. equally. And I think the writer did a really good job because it's really hard to get the lives of five characters into one book and i understand tell me if i'm right but i think that the um the the stories of the different characters are all separate but at the end they all kind of come together yeah they are yeah. intertwined in a way and it's beautiful it's okay. really beautiful yeah so you have talked about it as being the dark side of crazy rich asians and you've talked about loving the characters so was it an emotionally com Compelling, satisfying read? Yeah, I would say it was a really satisfying read because the prose is really good. And the way I could connect as a reader is I live in Dhaka, which is, you could sort of compare it to Shanghai, which is where the story is based in, because Shanghai is one of the fastest growing cities and so is Dhaka. So right. you have a lot of hustlers, people with big dreams here. And there's a character in the book who comes from a lower uh, financial background and there is also a character in the uh, in the book who comes from a really rich background but he sort of goes through an identity crisis of who he, he is amidst all that money and stuff so you sort of connect with all these people and their conflicting feelings because I live in Dhaka and I see all of that around me of how things are growing how money affects and how economy affects your personal life and I think I could really connect and take that from each of the character. And that I thought was really satisfying to read. That makes it sound even more interesting to me. That was, a, I'm so glad you raised that point. What Bangladeshi writer or novel or collection of short stories would you recommend somebody who's never read anything from Bangladesh? Well, fun fact. So this is like the fifth year of our independence. So a literary house came up with a book called Golden Bangladesh at 50. So it's an uh, anthology of some of the biggest literary uh, writers of Bangladesh at the moment. It includes all the contemporary writers, all the young writers, as well as the old ones who are really, really good at their craft. So I really suggest people getting their hands on that book because it's, it's the perfect story that captures Bangladesh since it's based on the theme of Bangladesh at 50, of oh. 50 years of independence. and just, just came out like last month. Yeah, it came out last month. It's yeah, I just found book. it on Goodreads. Well, that's what I'm going to start with. Yeah, it's an amazing book. I think we have a lot of history starting from the war in 1971 to now. We have a lot of history. We are going through sort of, uh, we are building our ideas identity as a nation so we have a lot of stories to tell so I think this book really sums up uh, where we are at at 50 years of age and I think another writer I really love is Tahmina Anam mm -hmm. she has a book called the Bangladesh Trilogy and you should read that and there's another writer called Farah Guznavi it's called Fragments of River Song well so now I want to read Tash Ah more than I ever did before. And I've got some good recommendations for some Bangladeshi literature. This is fantastic. Uzra, yeah. you're a fantastic guest. Will you come back? Yeah, hopefully. Like, if you invite me, uh, I'm will, just like popping in. I will invite you. Thank you so much. Oh.